Jupiter um, had moons that went around it, like the moon goes around the Earth. You can see these dots and how they change its position on different nights. These and many other discoveries are being celebrated this year in the International Year of Astronomy. So let me just give a little advertisement. Astronomers everywhere are inviting people to come and experience the heavens for themselves. You can do that right here on campus at the Calvin Observatory, open clear Wednesdays after 7.30 p.m. Uh, for those of you listening at other locations, look for an astronomy club in your area and uh, discover the moon and heavens for yourself. Bring the kids, bring the grandkids, it'll be great. Okay. Um, Galileo's discoveries were made in the context of a debate over the solar system. For many centuries before Galileo, scholars believed the ancient Greek model that the Earth was at the center of the solar system and the Moon and Mercury and Venus and the Sun here all went around the Earth. But Galileo's discoveries, particularly of Venus, I won't go into details, supported a new model of the universe that the Sun was at the center and Mercury and Venus, the Earth and Moon all went around the Sun, the model we know today. But church teaching was still in terms of that earth-centered model. Galileo's opponents quoted the Bible. Psalm 93.1 says, the earth is fixed and cannot be moved. That's very clear, there it is. But Galileo was a Christian himself, and he wrote, Holy Scripture teaches us that the glory and greatness of Almighty God are marvelously discerned in all his works and divinely read in the open book of heaven. He wrote elsewhere that the intent of Scripture was not to teach the science of astronomy. He pointed out that the names of the planets aren't even mentioned in the Bible. But in the post-Reformation era, the Catholic Church was not fond of individuals deciding for themselves what the intent of Scripture was. So things went downhill from there. Galileo basically called the Pope a simpleton, and the Church put him on trial and banned his books. Now, this incident is often cited as the prime example of conflict between Christianity and science. But Galileo himself didn't see a conflict. He believed God was revealed in both scripture and the open book of heaven. The idea of God revealing himself in two books, the natural world as well as scripture, uh, was not new with Galileo. It's in the Belgian Confession, it's in other church writings, Augustine, it goes all the way back to Psalm 19. This is, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's very useful. It reminds us that both books are authored by God, and because of that, they can't conflict with each other. God speaks truthfully in both books. Conflicts do arise, but they arise at the level of human interpretation down here. Science is the human interpretation of nature. Biblical scholarship is the human interpretation of scripture. Conflict comes when we make an error in one side or the other in those interpretations, or in both. In Galileo's case, it turned out he had the correct interpretation of nature, that the earth goes around the sun, abundant evidence has shown that. And Christians agree today that there are better interpretations of the verse, the earth is fixed and cannot be moved. Even if science and biblical interpretation are basically on the right track, there still can be major conflicts arising down here because of the influence of uh, you know, the spin put on them by philosophy, politics, theology, church tradition, theological bent, that sort of thing. In Galileo's case, his arrogant personality, university politics, and the post-Reformation environment greatly aggravated the conflict. So a lesson from this is that the church's response to conflict should not be to throw out one side or the other. Scripture doesn't trump nature. Nature doesn't invalidate scripture. Instead, when there are conflicts, we should remember that in both books, God addresses us with full authority. We should hang on to both sides, re-examine both human interpretations, and re-examine the influence on our thinking of uh, politics and tradition and so forth. And we do this, though, in the good hope that we will discover the underlying unity of truth that God has revealed in both Scripture and nature. Okay, let's turn our attention back to science. Over the centuries, evidence has been piling up about the history of the Earth. There are multiple independent lines of evidence for an old Earth and universe. Glaciers have annual layers of ice that can be counted back 720,000 years. That's 70 sometimes longer than the 10,000 years for young Earth creation. Uh, rocks have layers from ancient lake bed sediment that can be counted back millions of years. This igneous rock formation in Greenland has been dated using multiple radioactive isotopes to 3.6 billion years old. It's one of the oldest rock formations on Earth. Now, much more could be said about the geological evidence for age. We recommend the recent book, The Bible, Rocks, and Time by Davis Young and Ralph Sturley. Um, and that and other resources are on your handout, including our own book, of course, in the webpage. Now, astronomical evidence agrees about this long history. 
The rovers on Mars have discovered that Mars also has a long history. It has an ancient past of water lakes on the surface and a warmer atmosphere. The life cycle of stars and clusters shows that some cl star clusters are over 12 billion years old. And I could keep piling on the evidence here, but for now, I'll just explain one in more detail. And that comes from galaxies. This is our neighbor galaxy, Andromeda. Uh, you can see here that, it, like the Milky Way, it has hundreds of billions of stars. It has beautiful spiral arms. It even has two satellite galaxies. There's several um, different types of measurements that say it's 2.5 million light years away from us. Now, what does a light year mean? That means it takes light 2.5 million years to travel from Andromeda to us. So that means we're not seeing it as it is now, but as it was 2.5 million years ago when the light left it. So 2.5 million sounds like a huge number, I know. But in terms of galaxies, it's actually pretty close by. Um, it's close enough that Andromeda would appear quite large on the sky if it was bright enough. For comparison, here's how large the moon appears on the sky. If Andromeda was bright enough, it would look six times bigger than the moon. Wouldn't that be cool? I'd love to see that on the sky. In my research, I studied much smaller patches of sky. Here's the small patch. Um, <laughs> If we zoom in, though, uh, we see a beautiful picture of a galaxy cluster made by my research student, Luke Leisman. It shows dozens of galaxies, including several spiral galaxies. See there? Spiral, spiral, spiral. Lots of spirals. And those are just like the spiral galaxy Andromeda, except they look incredibly tiny. That's because they're over 500 times uh, farther away than Andromeda. Because comparing those different sizes, we calculate that this galaxy cluster is uh, 1.4 billion light years away. So we're seeing these galaxies, not as they are now, but as they were over a billion years ago. We're directly seeing the long history of the universe. Okay, that's some of what God has revealed in nature and how most scientists interpret it. Now let's turn to scripture. What has God revealed there? And um, how do we interpret passages like Genesis 1? Well, here's a bad interpretation of Genesis 1. God's busy at his desk. The earth and the moon are sitting there. He's got his to-do list with, uh, there's going to create light, firmament, land, etc. cetera. Oh, there just aren't enough days in the week for all I've got to do. Wait a minute. I'm God. I'll just make more days. <laughs> okay. So, uh, no, no Christian... <laughs> No Christian seriously believes that God was stressed over his to-do list during creation. And the first day of the biblical week is Sunday, not Monday. But many different interpretations of Genesis 1 have been proposed over the years. Uh, in our book, we discuss no less than nine interpretations. God's people have consistently affirmed the authority of Scripture, but they've often disagreed about what it means. One approach is to say that God created the world just a few thousand years ago, but that he made it look billions of years old. That would mean those distant galaxies, uh, God would have had to create the light in process, traveling to us already, including all the details of what's going on in those distant galaxies. We and many Christians disagree with this approach because it has God saying one thing in scripture and a contrary thing in nature. It gives up hope for that underlying unity of God's, both of God's revelations. Another approach is to inter every, interpret every Bible passage as literally as possible, except for the really obvious ones like the earth is fixed and cannot be moved. The problem with that is that it means picking and choosing which verses are you going to say are literal, which are not. And it ends up using science to make that choice, and that's not very consistent. So we need a better approach, something that's going to work for all Bible passages. Many theologians say that a good strategy is to first consider what the passage meant to the inspired human author and original intended audience, and second, apply that message to our lives and the world today. So how do we do that first step? Well, this involves translating the text accurately, studying its literary genre, and considering the cultural and historical context of the time. That's a bit of work, but it gives a better understanding of the original message, and it helps us be less likely to project our modern biases onto the text, like stress over to-do lists. Notice that this strategy does not lead down a slippery slope to denying the historicity of the whole Bible, which is a big concern. Instead, it leads to little, literal interpretations of some passages and non-literal interpretations of others. For example, the Gospel of Luke starts with Luke explaining that he carefully investigated everything, gathered eyewitness testimony, etc., a nearly modern approach to historical writing. Luke and his readers saw Jesus' literal historical death as central to the Gospel, and applying that second step, so should we. Okay, so let's apply this two-step strategy to Genesis 1. 
The cultural context for the ancient Hebrews was the surrounding nations of Egypt and Babylon. These cultures didn't write history as we 